Hello, I'm Louis Melendez, and welcome to Silent Speaks TV, helping to restore faith in God one conversation at a time. I'm joined by Jacob Cooper, who in September 1993, at the tender age of three, suffered a near-death experience, and his life would be forever transformed. Hi, Jake. Louis, a pleasure to be here. Thank it's you an, for it, having it's me. an absolute delight to have you in this, our inaugural uh, Silent Speaks TV program. Thank you so much indeed for being here. It's a true pleasure and a true honor to be here with you. Jake, I would love to begin with this interview by you taking us back to that day, that very life-changing event at the age of three. Absolutely. So my near-death experience um, occurred at the age of three. Um, and it was right before the Jewish High Holiday of Yom Kippur, a day when we are judged if we were going to live with health and prosperity that year or if there's going to be difficulties. So it's an onset in, found in the foundational point in the Jewish tradition that I grew up with as to what your year would be like. And mm -hmm. so little did I know that my year and my lifetime from that foundational point would be uh, quantumly different than I was uh, thought that I would be. And so at the age of three, um, I experienced um, suffocation due to the deprivation of oxygen. It all began when I went with uh, family friends to a park that was right by where my family friends lived. And I was in a car, and I was with my sibling and my two family friends who we're still good friends with to this day. Um, they could still recount the story and the tale um, that I had. And at you know, at that time, when I was in the car, I had a bit of uh, familiarity in a sense that I've seen this moment before. And there, there was a part of me that knew that something profound was going to happen. But I couldn't quite put my finger on what that was, or what it was. But I knew in my mind that this was quite familiar. But as I was in the car physically, uh, I began to notice that my breath was becoming a bit short. Mm. and I was becoming a bit nauseous in that car ride. Uh, but being very young, um, the, my t mentality is that you tend to uh, go to the thorn bush when otherwise informed not to. And so for me, the only thing that mattered during that time was having a good time in the park. That's all I wanted to do, um, so to speak, God's children just in the playground just mm. wanting to play. And so I wanted to just have fun. And so when I exited the car, I ran at, as fast as I can um, to a slide. Mm -hmm. And so when I was climbing up the slide, slowly but surely, I began noticing my breath began to continually uh, decrease. And so mm -hmm. the deprivation of oxygen was intensifying during this period. Uh, it was one of the scariest periods and most pressing periods of my lifetime. Uh, you know, the breath is something that we don't even think about, and yet it's our uh, a connecting point to vitality, to mm -hmm. life. Without the breath, there is no life as, as we know it. And so when this was taken from me, I, was, I felt c quite alone and quite isolated in my own suffering. And then as I was, I was, as I was continuing to climb this ladder uh, to the slide, you know, again, my breath began uh, decreasing until there was a point when there was no um, breath and I wasn't able to breathe in any form of oxygen. And so slowly but surely, at the top of the slide, after going on the ladder, uh, my body began to shut down one part at a time, uh, almost as if, if you know of any homeowner who takes a power breaker in their basement mm -hmm. and they began to shut down the power breakers, uh, that's what I was occurring to my body. It was all beginning to shut down and it was just escaping me. And so uh, the last part that I was in that I noticed uh, was, was my brain. And so uh, looking down, now that my body was shut down, I was in a disembodied state, okay. and I was able to have higher awareness of all of my neurological functionings. Mm -hmm. And at, as I tell some of my viewers and in my book, I, at the time I was laughing from viewing a place from a higher vantage point because I could all, you know, understand all the different neurological centers and their functionality. And so there was a higher part of my awareness I was able to understand that. And I laughed that people will use the brain to understand the brain. But in reality, it would be like trying to use the hand to under understand the hand itself. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have a higher intelligence and a higher energy that knows all about uh, the unspoken and, and the parts of ourselves that we don't readily are able to process with our own 
left analytical information uh, senses in our uh, language part of our brain. And so during this time, I noticed that my brain, from uh, being enamored with it and being in a sense of familiarity with it, was beginning to shut down uh, due to the deprivation of oxygen that was occurring as I contracted whipping cough at that time. Mm -hmm. And so slowly but surely, my brain began to snap in half, almost mm -hmm. as if you took a cord in a room and, s and, and yank it as hard as you can. And literally, my brain just snapped in half, and I could hear the largest crack sound that I ever can imagine. And once my brain snapped in half, you know, that's when I went down a dark tunnel about a thousand miles an hour, and mm -hmm. I could feel my spirit, my soul, vibrating at some insane speed. And after the end of this tunnel was a beautiful vista of colors and beautiful, uh, beautiful light at the end of this tunnel. And so my soul, or who I am in the quantum field of who I was, which was not on my body, uh, decided to enter this beautiful vista of colors. Mm -hmm. And then after, I was going about a thousand miles an hour, vibrating, and I could feel my essence vibrating to a whole new higher plane and higher dimension. And when I was vibrating, I was able to look down on my body, which was now on the top of the slide. Um, and so I was able to look through the right side of my brain. And through, through the right side of my brain, I was able to be aware of a magnificent golden palace that I knew instantaneously. Uh, if I could express it in, in words that viewers would understand, was the house of, of God as we know it, or the great light, or the, the all that ever was and could be. And the, um, you know, and so when I was able to connect to this palace, it was such a golden, bright light that I had to shield my eyes uh, from viewing this light. It was so profound. It was so powerful. Uh, but in looking deeper in the light, I recognized beautiful angelic hymns in sound emanating from mm. this palace that was right by me, and it was the most magnificent, magnificent symphony of choir of angels that were around this palace, and I knew this was the palace of the great light, all the, all, the, all, all the was that ever was and ever will be. And it was the most magnificent moment that I've ever experienced uh, in my lifetime. And then during this moment, at the same time simultaneously, I looked at, at a beautiful gold to brown kind of field during this time. And when looking in this field, there was an experience of eternity as if I understood that all is well. Uh, there was nothing to worry about. There was nothing to be concerned. And during this moment, slowly, I was beginning to feel and experience the whispers of, of Christ on the other side. And I was enveloped in the most um, profound feeling of unconditional love. And what the feeling that I could best describe is, is as if every single thought and every single action and who I was to a core was understood and accepted. And it was quite an unfamiliar experience that I had in my short lifetime, you know, as Jake, as we know it, where everything that I was was okay. It was more than okay. It was taking in this great deal of unconditional love from Christ and this protection because I was having, you know, a lot of trepidations knowing that my life as I knew it might change or this body might go and I might transition to another realm and go on. And slowly during this time, I began to notice that my body was at the top of the slide. And to my right side and left side of me were my male and female spiritual guides. And we're going to, I'm sure, discuss a little bit more about spiritual guides because I think it's very important for viewers to understand what exactly they are and how could we be able to be assisted by them. But I noticed that as my body was going down the slide, my two spiritual guides accompanied me, and they're the most beautiful angelic beings that I've ever seen. And I could look at them, and their light was so profound, and they were protecting me, loving me, and I knew instantaneously who they were, and I felt a, a sense of almost embarrassment as to how, I've to how I wasn't able to remember their presence was with me uh, my entire three years on the planet, and how I knew them so deeply, and how they had such a profound impact and connection to me uh, in this uh, lifetime. And so as they were going down with me on the slide, I began to notice that my body and was on the ground flat. And I was looking upwards on it, 
from the disembodied state, looking down on my body, on the floor of the park, right on the edge of the slide. And slowly I noticed a gathering of all the individuals that went to the park who were circling my body and who were gathering it with you know, concerns. I wasn't responsive to any calls or I wasn't able to talk and I was just you know, there you know, almost lifeless and I was suffocated on the ground. Um, and so during that moment I was able to notice all of my family friends that accompanied me to the park and I was able to look at their auric fields and I was able to see their, their colors of their auras and their magnificent dancing auras when they were surrounding me and there was a part of me that was able to understand their essence and why they were here and who they were on a deeper level and I was able to understand the eternal nature of, of these beings and their profound impact in my life and how they really had such a profound connection to me and some of the whys that connected us to much deeper connections than just those three years that I knew them. And when I was able to also look at, at the people who were around me, uh, I did a test to see if the man who ended up saving my life also had spiritual guides and had an auric field. And it turns out he had beautiful guides that I was able to connect to and a beautiful, magnificent auric field. And it taught me something that spirituality is not reserved to a select few, but rather it is who we are to a core, all is spirit. Some have a, what Plato would refer to, less of a veil of forgetfulness, or they drink from less of the waters of forgetfulness so that they remember their true essence. But in a sense, we're all pure light, we're all pure spirit. You know, no one has a monopolization of that. That's who we truly are to a core. And I was able to even look at my sibling and my brother who was with me and family friends, and I was able to see not only you know their past and their every thought that they had, but the future lives that they would live. And I was able mm -hmm. to pick up my brother going into medical school and becoming a doctor and the profound connection uh, that we would have you know, uh, you know, in life. And so during this moment, I was greeted by thousands of angels that were now o hovering over my body. And there's many forms of angels, and I'm sure we're going to get into some of the different hierarchy and in roles and um, the different forms and types and archetypes of angels. But these angels, the best way that I could describe them, were almost kind of like cherubim-like or childlike mm -hmm. angels mm -hmm. that you would see, you know, at the top of, uh, you know, churches and, and in art. And so I always say art is just allowing yourself to, to go away and you're able to tap into a higher realm, meaning it has to come from somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't come from any other experience other than a higher plane and a higher connection. Uh, it's a form of uh, higher channeling. And as I connected to the angels, I was able to see that these cherubim were, f were going up and down very slowly, and they had no direction that they were looking in. They were just looking in straight, and so they weren't even looking at me. But they all looked uniformly pretty much the same, and I was able to tap into the beautiful symphony that was coming out of them and the vibration that was coming out of these angels. And so for a moment, uh, you know, being in the left brain world that I was brought up in, you know, into three years, I almost had to pinch myself to see, was this real? Was this a hallucination? Was this a manifestation of my imagination or, or of my trauma that I was experiencing? And I couldn't believe what was right in front of me, almost looking at you right here, but it wasn't directly in front of me. It was floating you know, right above me and going upwards and downwards. And they were sending, you know, a lot of higher love and higher healing to the planet. And it was just a magnificent choir of angels that greeted my body that was, you know, just flatlined, you know, lifeless on the, on the floor. You know, and then in a moment's time, I was greeted by slowly my soul family that was accompanying me on the ground and all of my, um, you know, team as I would call it, or angelic team, and spiritual guides, and angels that were surrounding me, and uh, family friends and that were with me during these moments. And when I saw, you know, my f my soul family as I know it, um, there was quite a familiarity when I looked into all of them. It was like a team or a squad, so to speak, but a squad that that I knew, you know, to the core. There wasn't a person or a thought that I wouldn't know very clearly. Um, it was almost like an enmeshed understanding of looking at an extension of yourself, so to speak. And so when I saw them, there was quite a feeling of embarrassment. 
Um, and you know, we'll get into as to why I was embarrassed or why that was there. But um, to keep it brief for the here and now, the embarrassment happened because there was transparency from all beings on the other side. And so there was no politicians. You couldn't put on a facade like we do in this world. Whatever you thought, therefore you were. And it was echoed. And thought was just merrily wavelengths and vibrations. And so that would be picked up by anyone. You couldn't filter your thoughts through your speech. Whatever you thought, that was right there. And so there was quite a transparency. And it's almost an embarrassing moment as if the Queen of England has come into your home and your house was a bit of a mess or a bit of a wreck during that moment. And you were afraid of um, the vulnerability of looking at your every action and every thought. And so when all of my angelic team and spiritual team were surrounding me at this moment, uh, I was greeted with profound love, profound understanding, uh, profound guidance, and I felt safe and I felt okay. And all was well. Um, and then, you know, slowly I was greeted by a uniform question by all of my spiritual team, as I would call it, as to what I would do. And this was the most profound question that I ever had to face, as in what you, what you would do, as in would you stay with us in the heavenly dimension, you know, or would you go back to that lifetime as Jake? And so in that moment, I couldn't think of an answer because what was in front of me, the beautiful light of God, the connection and, and, and pure uh, love that I felt with Christ and with God and with angels, it was something so foreign to me. Uh, it was an unconditional love that I didn't quite experience no matter how good of a background and a family that I grew up in. And it seemed like a better alternative, uh, certainly in some circumstances, that there was, was no worry, there was no time. I was just basketed in the eternal love of, of the higher heavenly dimension. And during this time, um, I put on a bit of my lawyer hat or my advocate hat, and I just asked, well, um, let's make a deal, kind of, so to speak. And I had you know, channeled a bit of my ancestry with, with that question as to how to cut a deal uh, and try to, I guess, bargain or, 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 uh, or try to work out a deal, so to speak. And so I asked, if I were to stay, you know, what would happen within this lifetime? Uh, and slowly, I was being shown on a clairvoyant basis, on a visual basis, um, every part of, of me within this lifetime. Uh, and so the best way I could describe this would be a bit of a life, what would be termed as a life review, which is you're able to experience every thought, deed, action, not only through yourself, but the eyes of another, and how you impact the world around you, and how your words, your deeds, your actions are sought through those around you. And this life review didn't just stop with this carnation. Uh, I was able to travel the world during this time and go over the overlay of the earth plane. And so on the other side, there's the light you know, dimension that I was connected to, but there's also a part of the other side that has the same earthly features with a lot less um, worrying about sky miles, meaning wherever you want to go, you could be. And it's, uh, you know, it, it, it has the culture of the land and the geological contours of the land, and so it's a bit of an overlay of that land. But the highest level, as we know it, is getting to the light of God, which is pure light and doesn't have any you know, physical form or characteristics. Um, so th there's a bit of steps to get to that light. Uh, but as I was going over some of the parts of the world, and my soul was uh, astral traveling on the other side to different parts of the heavenly dimension of, of this you know, plane, I was able to travel back into lifetimes in the Asian cultures and Asian areas, and I was able to look at lifetimes in India, and lifetimes in the Native American culture and civilization. I was able to even recall lifetimes in uh, what we would know as Atlantis, which Edgar Cayce speaks about mm -hmm. uh, very readily in some of his uh, you know, channelings and stuff like that. So I was able to look at you know, that as well. Uh, but the most profound lifetime was my last carnation uh, that I could remember offhand sitting here in, t in, you know, in this day. Uh, and that was a lifetime, to keep it you know, a bit to the point, uh, that was a lifetime where I had what, what I would refer to as a hubris, where a lot of my success as a religious teacher or spiritual teacher got to my head a little bit. 
and so there was a slow demise and so I lost you know you know my job I lost my respect and I was in trouble for some of the actions that I did and so during that moment I was cornered and I felt trapped and I actually you know took my own life and committed suicide in that lifetime uh, but when I was recalling that lifetime my soul got very emotional because the students of that lifetime slowly came into uh, my my awareness and I remembered my students from that lifetime you know very easily and there was a sense of eternal bond that we had that time and linear time could not stop us that it was always vibrating and we were together in a forever symphony during that time and space and so as that memory left me I was able to not only look at the past but also future uh, projection projected images of what would happen you know as Jake in this lifetime in this body and I was able to see flashing images and eventually the one lasting image that I saw of future event future events to come uh, was of myself teaching and this wasn't um, you know someone who was just teaching from an egoic standpoint or or of ego or to just flaunt themselves not at all this was a teaching in which I and the participants were to become one with one message were to become with one with a pr profound message to have a quantum change you know on all the participants that would come my way and so during this time as beautiful as the heavenly octaves on the other side that I was in or as home as I refer to it oftentimes in my current book that I'm writing was um, the fact of the matter is bringing um, consciousness and bringing changes to consciousness uh, was a profound driving point for myself and um, a beautiful um, symphony that I could not reject. And so during that time, um, I asked that I would agree to, to this lifetime, to commit to a lifetime, to be a teacher, a messenger, um, just a delivery man and a harbinger of good news to many who are seeking answers, to re-remember and recall their own inner truths. And so during that time, all of the angelic beings began to slowly dissipate, you know, and leave me. And I felt quite abandoned during that time as I was um, in the hands of, 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 of heavenly divine love. And um, there wasn't an isolated experience. I was with the love of others. And I was in the hands and the love of others. And during that time, um, as all of my spiritual guides and angels and soul family members left me, I was left with one more question as to um, how could this life, how could this commitment, how could this contract uh, be coming into fruition? How could this happen? And the profound message that I got was to always monitor your thoughts because thoughts have a profound ramification on the life that could work towards the, the high road and the platform that you were in the life that you were supposed to live or they could deter you from that. But either way, the path is there. The path is laid out. It's just gaining trust in your ability to go down that path and to remember your capabilities and to recall that this lifetime is very much about calling in a service to others. And so with that thought, everyone left my side um, as I knew it, uh, but I knew that they were always there with me you know, it just wasn't always within my constant awareness or right in f directly in front of me. Um, and so during this time, I was greeted by, you know, my mother, who was obviously very concerned and was back in the hospital bed. Uh, and so during this time, um, I had a lot of emotions running through me. Uh, there was a part of me that almost expected to have a bit of a royal treatment, as if I was the one who turned down the other side and I was the one who came back to this reality and I almost had an expectation and a regalness to myself that things would be handed to me on a silver platter and that life would be very smooth and I would be understood. Well, I was up for a rude awakening as a couple moments later a, uh, the doctor at the time tried to medicate myself and I was evasive from him and I ran around the room and. I was kicking and I was acting like a kid and my mother told me that I kicked the doctor so hard that he could barely walk. <laughs> so there was this rage, there was this anger, uh, but it was an anger that wasn't able to be expressed. Uh, there was this trauma that I had and this profound experience that I couldn't express and I knew at that moment that, you know, even if I tried, you know, I could see my mother's emotion that there wasn't this awareness as to the, as to the majestic experience that I had 
of, of going to this royal kingdom and this, this place of familiarity and this place of the house of the essence of, of who we are as spiritual beings having human experiences. Uh, and so, you know, what I figured out later in life was not everyone was going to understand me, but my job was to process this experience and make sense of this experience. And every day is an unfoldment to better understand this experience, to cultivate it in the life of myself, and more importantly, through that of the life of others. And just pick, you know, every day putting the canvas in front of myself and depicting a more inspirational message and understanding from that experience, as that experience is eternal. And every day you look at it in a different way. So in sum and in short, that's a bit of the experience that I had, you know, but every day is an unfoldment of looking at it through a different angle. Sure. Uh, yeah. Well, <coughs> Jake, simply extraordinary. And I'm sure, like myself, many of our viewers will see the, the, uh, the glow and the passion. This is almost this memory isn't that far removed. This is almost as though you can touch it, taste it, and feel it, even after so many years. Mm. Uh, there are so many things, so many uh, things to digest from that. You talked about the soul's immortality. You talked about coming to the house of the Lord, experiencing grace firsthand. Mm. You talked about the angelic kingdom. You talked about uh, various classifications of angels. You talked about spirit guides and that familiarity with them. You talked in many ways you, uh, of previous lives, of reincarnation, this principle of law, cause mm. and effect. Mm. And you can even see yourself now being projected into the future and also the, those of your loved ones. You mentioned your brother. There is so much there to pick apart. And I'd like to, with your permission, to just to begin, Absolutely, Lewis, at, yes. At, at the very beginning, when we begin to have the shutdown of the brain, now there's this underlying tension, which you very well know, where there, uh, for many of us uh, who are skeptical of these kind of religious claims of soul immortality, that for, for many, the idea of consciousness is, is nothing more really than a, a natural, harmless consequence of neural activity. But here you are in a disembodied state. You're watching your organs shutting down. You're watching your brain shut down, and then this great moment when that completely shut down, yet you are in full awareness. So what would you say to perhaps uh, people that are still skeptical about that? What lessons can you draw? What are the implications from your experience? Yes, you know, I think skepticism is quite healthy as it allows everyone to come up to their own conclusions you know with with their own findings and I think that that's very important um, and so what I would say is within my own experience and with many of my other colleagues who have had near-death experiences uh, what I could discuss is once my brain suffocated once 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 I was suffocated my brain was deprived of oxygen you know, after that was when I was able to experience a whole new profound awareness where it was more of an awareness that I would have within this physical dimension. You know, every thought, deed, action was, was clear. So for the skeptics or, or the scientific paradigm to, that says that consciousness is merely just a production of the brain, and once the brain goes, you know, then so too um, we do, and there's, there's no continuity. But what I would suggest or, or, or ask them is, if that's the case, then how do you prove people like myself and the you know, eight to 10 millions of Americans who have been uh, recorded to have near-death experiences to have continual profound recall and experiences once their bodies have been flatlined or once uh, their brains have been deprived of oxygen and shut down? How would the brain be able to produce any form of thought uh, if it's shut down. At the very least, you would have a very primal-based thought within your brain, but it wouldn't be profound, it wouldn't be deep. Um, that's, you know, impossible. Uh, but there's countless stories, and mm -hmm. so what I would recommend people to do is to look into a lot of the, um, you know, archived, you know, near-death uh, stories. Uh, for instance, you know, I've, I've read of a tennis shoe story where someone had a near-death experience and they're able to be so aware of their experience in a disembodied state that they were able to go on top of the hospital and spot a tennis shoe on the roof.
from being right in the hospital mm -hmm. bed. And they never left the room, and they never went to the roof. And so they asked, after their, their experience, they said to the medical personnel, did you know that there is a tennis shoe on the roof? And they go, why, why are you telling me this? That's kind of irrelevant. Sure enough, they checked out, and there was a tennis shoe right on the roof of the hospital. And these are just some small examples you know, of some of the heightened awareness that near-death experiencers have you know, in the hospital, with their families, with loved ones, that could never be explained, you know, at the very least, when you're um, deprived of oxygen, you're lifeless, you should have very little primal type thought, not, prof not more profound awareness that you wouldn't have, you know, in the waking state. So it's, it's interesting, you yeah. know, and it really causes people to kind of question the nature of consciousness and the nature of reality. So oh, That's yeah. right, Drake, and you make reference, uh, I've read a lot of um, uh, uh, profound stories where uh, loved ones are lying there uh, under anesthesia in this, uh, with a surgical procedure, yet they find themselves now here overhearing what the conversations are happening mm -hmm. with not only within their ward but in other wards, and they come back mm -hmm. to report those experiences again, uh, not readily uh, explainable. Mm -hmm. And there is a wealth of inf information. I would encourage certainly our viewers to, to do that and look at the NDE research. Yep. That's very exciting indeed. Uh, Jake, you also talked a little bit about um, uh, angels and spiritual guides, and, and this, uh, you know, as a spiritualist, uh, very much uh, following the path of mediumship, having that contact with spiritual guides uh, is, a, is a crucial one. There is no power of healing, there is no clairvoyance, there is nothing of any significance in the absence of that grace, in the absence of that power. So I know a lot of viewers who particularly follow these paths, the shamanistic path or these kind of paths where you have these relationships with spiritual entities such as spiritual guides. What can you, what can you say about them? Are, are these them and angels are, are, would you consider these as kind of abstractions of mind that, that perhaps they represent some unconscious symbolism, some meaning, inner meaning? Or do you see, like many other traditions, that they are in fact sim no different than us, just as in a disembodied state, souls evolving with purpose, with goals and objectives, just like us, and they have a very special purpose. How would you describe them? Yeah, you know, it's, it's I, don't, I wouldn't say it's a one fi size fits all. You know, we all have different spiritual guides, some of them that we're contracted to in the pre-birth plan and, 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 and our blueprint and our life plan. And sometimes we connect uh, to other guides throughout our lifetimes. And so they, they might change, they might shift as we evolve and as we grow as, 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 as souls. Uh, but from my experience, uh, looking at spiritual guides, the greatest um, way that I could describe it is almost as if it's the closest extension of yourself to yourself. It's, a, mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty much who you are to a core, uh, you know, and, and it's a very close extension. When I looked at the guides, it's almost like a higher version of, our, of yourself, your highest possible thought of who you are and how you can be, and that team around you. And so from knowing them, you know, I remembered later on after the experience, and I was able to connect to the life that I would plan in the charting period that I had. As a child, I remembered that period, and I remembered how pivotal the guides are in your, your moves that you make, and your careers, and your relationships, and how everything is pre-determined. You know, uh, you know uh, of course, free will has a factor you know, in that to, to change uh, your predetermined path, uh, but it's all for your own soul's evolution, and it's, everything has a purpose for you to evolve you know, within each rung of the ladder, so to speak. And each lifetime is another rung on the evolutionary ladder. Uh, but, you know, spiritual guides are, to me, the closest extension to who you are as you know yourself and the highest version and highest connecting point to yourself. And sometimes they have human characteristics, like my spiritual guides were a male and female entity and they were magnificent, you know, and beautiful. Um, you know, what I would say is our, our goals are almost to become, you know, to graduate this, this human experience and to go on to be a guide, to go on to be, you know, an angel. I do believe, you know, we are able to graduate and evolve to that if we do decide to elect to and if we get to that point. So it does vary. I mean, some, you know, I, 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 would, I would go on record to say that's, they're, they're just, you know, incarnated angels. That's who they are from the onset. You know, some might have had more 
of lifetimes on the earth plane or in other dimensions. So it, it varies with spiritual guides, mm. uh, really. That's beautifully explained. Thank you. And uh, there was a moment where you began to see the, the, the vista. You began seeing uh, angels or what some would describe as principalities, you know, thrones uh, of, of great of great majesty, and, and, and you described that experience as being a bit, it was getting to the point that its beauty was very <laughs> profound, and there was only yeah. so much that you can absorb. Oh, can absolutely. You, can you just touch a little bit more on that, please? You know, when you, um, th there is an incubation and adjustment period when you do cross over and go into the other side. And so for myself, I was kind of adjusting to uh, the speed and the vibration on the other side and the beauty of it. Uh, but for me, um, and for most of us, we're used to almost a limitation. Uh, having a physical body and having this big light condensed in this physical body with almost how good your experience can be. And a lot of that is based off of prior experiences. You know, For instance, if we were to go to a restaurant, we would compare that with our prior experience. So that's you know, ingrained in our linguistic kind of brain as to what that experience will be. Uh, but, but when you're on the other side, there's no limitations for how good you could possibly feel or how high you could possibly soar. And that's something maybe for, for viewers to kind of digest for a minute. There's no limitations for how high you can soar, how good you can feel. There's no cap. Mm. You know, in this human body, uh, there's, there's a cap, you know, because we're constricted at times to this body. And obviously through different forms of spiritual training and different exercises, you could expand your spiritual connection, spiritual awareness, but at the core, when you're in pure spirit form, you're connected to the all, and so there's no limitations for how good you could possibly feel. And so for me, that was something that was a bit too overwhelming. It was almost like this high that you get, and there was no stopping it. Mm -hmm. The only thing that stopped it was when I put on the brakes and I said that this is too much for me to handle, let's slow down let's adjust because my spirit was just overwhelmed by the light and the vibration that I was uh, experiencing and the, and the totality of it. So it was, it was pretty amazing. It, it reminds me of reading of uh, Paramahansa Yogananda's book, An Autobiography of a Yogi, where he says, uh, of all the qualities of the divine, the one quality the soul cannot get enough or resist is that bliss. Mm. You know, and, 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 and also, Jake, you talk a little bit about free will, its importance. Uh, uh, you talked a little bit about um, the framework. And, and, and just listening to what you're saying, you, you almost develop this kind of framework where the soul goes through a period of many reincarnations on this kind of path of self-realization or God-realization mm -hmm. to know what it is in essence, what its absolute reality. Would you, having experienced that near death, would you subscribe to that kind of framework where we are in fact, where we do in fact incarnate over many lifetimes to ach achieve just that? Absolutely, you know, and I do believe this lifetime is to remember who you are. And by that I mean who we are is, is a part of the divine, is a part of the God, is a, by, to part of the, to, a part of the higher consciousness, whatever your verbiage or label of it, but underneath that all is a part of us that is indeed unconditional love. And so through coming to the earth plane, as we know it, you know, love isn't unconditional, it, it's conditional. And where most of us are geared from day one, if we do well on a test, we feel good about ourselves. Um, you know, if we get a car, we feel good. If we acclimate more physical things, we feel good about ourselves. And so many people lose their true essence and they, they, they lose that part of ourselves. And so through re-remembering who you are as pure unconditional love, when you're able to allow that paradigm to be shifted and internalized towards yourself, everything will change. And as Wayne Dyer would say, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Mm. So, you know, it's, it's all about that inner connection, that inner love, and understanding how to accept that great light and with that great light comes that great shadow that comes within this lifetime. And learning how to work out some of those lessons and some of those parts so that we could be pure light and, and evolve to a greater, higher dimensional plane. Um, and again, beautiful, because you, you help me to understand the whole psychology behind mystics in terms of their approaches to self-purification, in terms of those disciplines and focusing on those 
divine qualities in many ways. They want to become the change that they want to see. They want to become living embodiments of that love. They want to experience that divine bliss mm. firsthand. And in many ways, the things that you're saying provide the logic, provide the mm. framework by which they begin to do so. And it sounds to me as though the brain in many ways, and, 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 and rightfully so, rightfully so, has a function. And one of those functions is just to filter out these spiritual realities because you also talk about maintaining a balance between this world and the next. And, how, and how important is that? You know, I made a, a post earlier for those who follow me on social media uh, that in today's day and world, you know, you know, across the scale, we're, we're building uh, blockages, we're building walls, we're trying to prevent, you know, things from happening. But in reality, you know, the ultimate connector of love is a bridge. And so I view the brain when it's really working in parallel as merely a bridge between this world, this reality, you know, and from home or from that place or from the other side. And so when the brain is open and it doesn't get in their way and our chatter doesn't stop that flow, we're able to allow spirit to not come to us but through us. And so that is our higher guiding point and so that we, d we never uh, forget our true essence and our true essence is always flowing through us, you know, despite at times the difficulties of living this physical reality and how we could easily forget our true essence and where we come from, you know, and so the brain is very important to really purify, you know, that, that love to come through. And so a lot of people who aren't connected, you know, have a bit of a wall, you know, and they get, a, they, they have a wall with their own thoughts, with their own perceptions of reality, with their own limiting per perceptions about themselves that they don't listen, they don't open to the sacred silence that is always flowing through them. And so th from my near-death experience, I learned that once I was able to uh, lose myself, I was able to find myself. Mm -hmm. Once all a part of who I thought I was, which was existing in my brain and the, that little child in me and all that stuff, once I was able to lose that, I was able to regain a, an understanding of who I was with, with exploratory uh, under angles and curiosity. Jake, you really get me excited because you bring to life some of the most cherished books. Uh, Eckhart's Soul, The Power of Now, when we deconstruct the ego, when we get that out of the way in many ways, we reconnect with our true realities. Uh, perhaps books that uh, many of our viewers won't be listening to, but certainly those within the UK spiritualist movement will be. White Eagle Publications, where they talk about transforming the brain to a brain that feels and a heart that thinks, you know, finding this integration and that bridge of love. Now, having transcended the ego, now we have this kind of connection to our higher consciousness. Mm. So again, so thank you for breathing that. I, I just want to reconnect uh, with this past life in particular, where you were, uh, describe yourself as, a, as having a, a religious, you were a religious figure, uh, and then uh, you, you uh, committed suicide, I believe, in yes. that incarnation. Yes. Now, there are a lot of people that genuinely believe and suffer uh, because of the fact that perhaps within their own understanding that uh, those that cross over under the condition of suicide uh, face a life of great torment, an afterlife of great torment. But it doesn't sound that you would agree with that. No, um, it, it was, you know, it's a lot different than what you would think. You know, many times people, you know, kind of project and transfer uh, how we're governed in this lifetime, where if you commit a bad sin or if you're off, all of a sudden you are punished or you go to purgatory. And that's, you know, carried throughout cultures and religions. And so, you know, people put that depiction on how you know, it works with God and almost, you know, God is created in man's image, so to speak, and how we operate here and the conditions uh, and stuff like that. But, but on the other side, you know, what I found was, was God to me or the great light. Um, it wasn't a he or a she, it was just all that ever is and ever was, was profoundly, uh, the, the, was a profound unconditional love. And so you can never do no harm or no fault you know, you were basketed in that love and you're always guided to mm. have you know, future lessons to rectify, you know, that part of you. Because when you go to the other side, um, yes, you're surrounded by the eternal bliss and all the angelic beings in love, but it also carry with you who you were. You know, that doesn't just change at the top of the hat. 
So your personalities, your perceptions, your fears, you know, are, are all kind of carried with you, you know, as a soul. And so each lifetime is a different opportunity to allow yourself to embrace embrace lessons so messages are no longer needed to be repeated, so to speak, and so that you could evolve and really come, f come more closer to who you are as a high loving, high vibratory being. Mm -hmm. uh, but with suicide, you know, it is indeed a decision, but it does not mean the end. It doesn't mean that you're punished. Um, what it does mean is that most likely, um, you know, people do elect to have other lifetimes to evolve from that, which I could, you know, attest, you know, as my experience, where I elected to have that ex to have another lifetime. Um, and you know, if you look at the my near-death experience, I could really understand maybe why I might have charted or elected to have a near-death experience because I was one of the few experiencers who experienced the light at the end of the tunnel, which um, has been popularized by media sensationalism. But if you look at uh, most near-death experience research, you know, studies on cases, you know, that's a infrequent, um, you know, experience that people have in, in terms of experience the tunnel. But I think for me, I experienced it to remind myself that no matter what darkness that you're going through, no matter how much you feel like you're stuck, much like I did in that lifetime, you know, there's always a potentiality of change, and that darkness will always go away. You know, it, it too shall pass. And who you are to a core is pure eternal light. And so that's just, you know, something that is distracting people from who they are. And so through great turmoil could come great awareness as people experience the dark night of the soul. Mm -hmm. You know, all of a sudden those periods become shake-up periods for great awakenings. Much like has happened through an Eckhart or a Neil when they were on rock bottom, once they lost themselves, again, they were able to find out who they were mm -hmm. from ego deconstructing and losing their boxed-in identity to become a much greater awareness as to who they were and who they belong to, you know. But suffering can be an expedited point to evolution and, and spiritual awareness, mm. uh, if you allow it to. Uh, Jacob, you, um, you know, prior to the show, we had a few conversations, and you were really keen to talk about uh, the implications, you know, moving forward. What these revelations and others like uh, other uh, near-death experiences what the implications of their stories are in terms of this new earth, to put it mm -hmm. in Eckhart Tolle's language, mm -hmm. where we have a, a world that is really fit for humanity, uh, in a world that is transformed spiritually as we transcend our ego limitations and move into higher consciousness. I know you're keen to discuss that, but I just want to, I want to just tease you there just momentarily because I want to, I want to talk about the person that you've become. I want to talk about the healing, the great healing work. I personally have benefited from your great healing you. work. Yes. And, 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 and Jake, I, I must say this, you know, I, I've been around healing for 18 years, you know, by the grace of God. And uh, there was something quite extraordinary by moving into your sacred space, and I mean that generally. There was something about the level of detail that was placed to every single aspect of my experience with you as a healer, let alone the energies that were transmitted. So it was quite something. And I can see, I can see now how this NDE experience just really opened the heart to allow for that channeling mm. to come through. But that's, that's just one part of the story because you do a lot of great work. And I want you to just give an insight for people that could really benefit from your experience, the kinds of things that you do now and how they can access your healing and, and psychotherapeutic services. Yeah, you know, so presently at this time, you know, one of my biggest inspirations has been to really learn uh, from my near-death experience. And one component that I have is trying to embody the angels that I encountered and learning how to unconditionally love, you know, others, but also allow, you know, my healing sessions uh, to, to, be, to run in parallels with the way that the angels worked. As above, so below is kind of my mm -hmm. uh, statement that I try to live in life and, and my ideology. And so when I saw the angels and they were sending uh, healing and, and energy down to the planet, you know, I, I was able to understand the value of, of, of our life's purpose was to be there, to make this world a brighter place, to be a bridge between heaven and earth, to allow ourselves to get past the illusion that we've been brought up in and to remember that we are so much more than others have perceived us. 
Uh, and so um, my whole goal is to transform that to the clientele that I uh, encounter. And so through my Reiki healing, I do, I, you know, it doesn't come to me, but through me. I don't have any goic uh, possessiveness of the healing. You know, it's all just coming through me. I put Jake out the door and it's just, you know, healing that comes through me. So I do have a private practice for Reiki healing uh, as well as past life regression. I do run mindfulness workshops and you know professionally work as a psychotherapist at a mental health clinic. And so I work with people from the ground up and if you've got a body, you've got a brain, you've got an openness, you know, I'm very you know, driven to try to help you meet, to meet your needs at any level from the ground up. And so um, you know, I try to work with the emotional, the physical, the spiritual, the psychological, you know, as many parts of a being that I can because we all are so many parts. Um, Within this world, we mostly see ourselves as, as physical, you know, and, that's, and, and as mental. And so uh, these, these sessions allow people to understand that there, are, there, there may be more that they're connected to, and there's other bodies that they're connected to. When you're able to do that, you're able to live a lot more of an empowered life, and you're out, a lot, able to be a lot more skillful in how you manage your energy, and how you manage yourself, and how you manage your emotions. So it creates a lot more awareness in some of my clientele that I encounter just to pull off some of the pieces to get to the core truth of who they are and what they're connected to. Thank you, Jake. And, and, and you've also been a guest speaker for the IANDS. That's right. And uh, I believe you have, you're have a guest speaker in this annual conference yeah, this year. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that, please. Yeah, you know, so the International Association for Near-Death Studies you know, has been around for quite some time. I know they're based out in North Carolina, uh, but they um, host, you know, all kinds of different speakers from near-death experiencers to spiritual transformative experiencers to out-of-body experiencers, uh, but they're geared towards, you know, understanding the nature of consciousness and how different stories have influenced and informed, you know, people's lives and the continuity of life, you know, after death or higher awareness and higher consciousness. You know, and so it's myself and uh, a lot of other ND near-death experiencers that are going to be there. I kind of make a private joke that it's myself and a bunch of walking zombies, as we <laughs> are the walking dead, you know, uh, coming out of, 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 of a period where most of us have been dead or flatlined or suffocated. But it's, 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 a, it's a wonderful sensation because you're able to be with people who understand and speak a similar language than you, and it's quite a position of, of comfort. Uh, because in this world, I could talk into a bloom in the face, but until someone has had an NDE and go through the entail of the struggle of integration of that experience, um, it could be a bit frustrating in the spoken word. And so when you go there, there's no need to speak. You just almost tele telepathically could connect to some of your other friends in the community. But the good news is you don't have to have a near-death experience to have one. Um, in my talks, I will often say that my experience is not mine. And by that I mean, if I were to hold on to it, what value would it have? So the value that it has is when I give it to someone else, that rock is skipped, that pebble is skipped, and that ripple effect occurs. Mm -hmm. But if I just hold on some, to something that's mine, where's the creation? Where's the impact? Where is um, you know, the, the down the road implications of that experience? So I don't take ownership of my experience. When I talk up there, my experience is, is their experience, is our experience. I don't have an ownership over it. It's, it's my job to allow it to flow through me to the people. And if it helps, maybe they could take that pebble and that jewel and share that with someone else to be a harbinger of good news to those who are in need of information uh, of the continuity of life after death. Yeah. It, it, it very much is a life of service that you're living, Jacob. And, and for our viewers, um, please, please know that Jake's details, all his contact details, and the events that he's getting up to this year will be posted, so not to worry there. Yes, and I, I did forget that it is, forget to mention that is, king, that is in King of Prussia at the Crown of, Crown of Plaza. So all that is listed on my webpage for anyone who might be interested in attending and hearing you know, some of the talks. It's just profound, the different angles and speakers that come in uh, to give their own workshops. And what's that webpage again for our viewers? So for anyone interested, my webpage is www.jacoblcooper.com. That's jacoblcooper.com. And on my page, you could find a full list of entails of, of services and different modalities of healing services that I do provide. 
as well as archived interviews and lectures and blogs. So. Yeah, and friends, I, I cannot recommend Jacob enough. It's something that if Thank you're within the Long <laughs> Island, Queens, New York City area, please do see this very gentle, very gentle soul. Uh, Jacob, I want to I wanna now give you uh, your soul, so to speak, a voice. Having had more than 25 years to process and, and learn from your experience, you know, what, what are the key takeaways for us, both individually, collectively, as a society? What can we learn from yourself and others like you from your NDE experiences? Absolutely. I think the one component that I have is, you know, that, that would be helpful if I were to, you know, nail it down, would be that people remembering that we all come from the same place and we all mm -hmm. go to the same place. Mm -hmm. Within that egoic construct that we discussed, you know, therefore, uh, that is, is, is a part of the downfall of man once we have a box and understanding of, of who we are and our religion and our culture. If we're not able to understand the me with the we, it becomes very much self-destructive, as we've seen in recent turns of events. So if anything, it's to remember that there are many paths up to the mountain, but at the end of the day, there's one light that we're all connected to, and the light is within each and every one of us. And part of this lifetime you know, is, is that we're in the illusion that we feel that we're different, you know, that people who look different than us or speak a different language or have different personalities or may test us you know, are different. But in reality, you know, there's, there's only one soul. There's only mm -hmm. one mind. We all are indeed one. And so the more that we're able to remember that, uh, you know, our experiences uh, would allow heaven to earth become a lot more readily available. Uh, but what gets lost in translation is the blinders that people have, you know, that taught that we're separate from one another, that we'd rather be right with our points than visiting the, pot the potential that others are the same as ourselves. And we'd rather, de we'd rather, um, we'd rather inflict pain, pain onto others than to maybe revisiting the parallels that others have. And so if there's anything to learn from the near-death experience is that we don't die, we come from the same place, we go to the same place, and it's our job to remember that light that we all share. And if we're able to do that, you know, this becomes a team effort and that we're all brothers and gatekeepers of the light of God, and mm -hmm. it's our responsibility mm -hmm. to protect, you know, the brethren and our fellow brothers and sisters here, you know, on earth. And, and it is a process, friends. I just want to say that uh, many of us will be touched by uh, Jacob's comments. And yet we struggle with dealing with our angers, with our biases, with our prejudices, you know. And so to just be kind to ourselves that we are having to work through many layers of, of density and debris that has many it clouded our true re divine reality. So, we, you know, so take on board this kind of great message because, Jacob, as, as I'm listening to you, I'm becoming aware of areas that I need to work on, blind mm. spots, and no matter how far you get along this path, there's always an area of improvement. Oh, Would you yeah. agree with that, sir? Yeah, no, with, with great light, you know, comes its great test. And so no matter who you are, we all have that shadow to work with, whether that's an individual or collective basis. Mm -hmm. And so I think right now with more people awakening, you know, there's a great light, but on that great light, there's casting a great shadow. And a lot of people don't know how to deal with that darkness, don't know how to deal with that shadow and they'd rather self-sabotage than actually work on befriending the shadow and learning how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. But I think you make a great point that throughout doing this work for a bit of time, I've never met someone who is immune to a shadow or a part of themselves that they need to work on. That's what makes us human beings, is that we all have that. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's our job and our duties to befriend that, to become aware of that. It's a constantly work on that. And almost you know, I don't believe we need to add anything. We just need to chip away at that masterpiece that's already there, as Michelangelo would say in his artwork. And so, really, that's what this lifetime is about, to remember that we come with this pure jewel, this pure masterpiece. And we have to, we have to continue to remember that, because a lot of life could block that, and a lot of difficult circumstances could block that. And so without, you know, doing the deep training that we, that we you know, and the stimuli that we handle and the stresses that we handle, you know, a lot of us and a lot of our connections to that deep part of ourselves will be blocked with negativity and negative experience and we'll have a false sense of connection to, to self. And so this work is not 
something that's that's very easy. It's rather very radical and self-confrontational. Mm -hmm. uh, but the true souls that that are doing the serious work uh, will attest to the immeasurable value that it has, not only on your surroundings but on your eternal existence. You know, and that this life is indeed an opportunity in a school to evolve your eternal soul, your eternal experience, and so that we don't have to come back here again in the karmic wheel, we could elevate and ascend to higher you know, planes of existence. Uh, you certainly bring forth this very optimistic view uh, of the future, Jake. Do you, what are the signs that really give you encouragement in terms of what you can see, the kinds of shifts in consciousness around our world today? What should we be taking notice of? Yeah, you know, if you're familiar with uh, Plato, and I know a lot of the Greek philosophers we talk about past lives and the afterlife quite frequently. If you follow Dr. Raymond Moody, he speaks of this extensively. Mm -hmm. But for the majority of us, if you're familiar with Plato's allegory of the cave, it's, um, mm -hmm. it's a representation of how most of us are living our reality, where we're sitting in a cave and we have depictions of uh, those behind us and we're in shackles and we're projected what images those behind us in power want us to see. And so through the most of us, you know, that's represented by, you know, media outlets, you know, and the news, you know, all, and all the global calamity that we're portrayed. It's through remembering that there's so much more than just this angle, that we have free will to decide what we want to focus on. And even if the world is imploding enough, you know, in flames, just by being present in that sacred silence and being connected to the love that you might have of a neighbor, or the bird flying around you, or the, or the flower blooming, or you know anything that that is around you that connects you to something bigger and grander because nature is just a reflection of that grand part that's within you as we're all connected so i think the the, the big component is to constantly revisit am i looking at the way that the world is depicting life to me or am i living life from the inside out and choosing and electing what do I want to be forward in my reality? Because wherever our mind goes, our energy follows. Mm -hmm. So it's not to be ignorant to what's happening, but it's always to be mindful of what's happening, not mindless to the constant neuroticism and fear and, and angst that's happening. Miracles are happening every day. Awakenings are happening every day. We just have to witness it and open up our eyes to see that, and that's mm -hmm. our duty. So um, I hope that helps. It does indeed. Yeah. Uh, Jake, you, you know, you've, you, you come from a very privileged, you have a very privileged perspective on all this. At the age of three, without any really conscious uh, application on your part, you were handed this incredible uh, a spiritual vantage point. For people like myself and others along the path that pray, uh, that really yearn for these kind of divine realizations, that those people that want that direct experience with God, what, what tools do we have at our disposal? to achieve just that? No, I, I thank you for asking me this question. It's a very pro, you know, important question you know, to, a, to answer. Um, you know, I think what happens is uh, we tend to transfer some of the way that the world works you know, in spiritual development. And by that I mean it means that we have to become something more than what we are. Yeah. Or we have to work for what we get and reap what we saw. And so there's a lot of work. Uh, what I would say is spiritual awakenings, and from my experience, happened because I was able to remove that concept of self, and I was able to enter the sacred eternity. Uh, and so what I would say is, you know, to, to find yourself, you have to be willing to lose yourself. Mm -hmm. and, to, and for many people, that is a scary reality. But a step to regaining yourself and refining that profound connection, as simple as it might sound, would be meditation. Mm -hmm. And by meditation, there's different forms of it, and I think everyone has to find something that might work. Uh, there might be you know, guided meditation, transcendental meditation, uh, mindfulness meditation, uh, but everyone has to have something that works with them, and some people might need a more active type meditation or walking meditation, mm -hmm. you know, but meditation is the quickest way to really allow you to get into those deeper brainwave states to access the sacred eternal flow that, that is always going through us. So that's, that's a wonderful tool, but also to not try to force it, because when we try to force it, when we try to muscle it, we just tend to bottle up more frustration and more of a dense type energy. So really to me, spiritual evolution and spiritual expansion is not a process of attainment of more, 
It is simply a process of reduction. And by reduction, I mean reducing thoughts, reducing emotion, reducing anxiety. And so you don't gain anything you know, through meditation. You merely lose and connect to that place within, that sacred silence that we all are connected to. Mm. You know, and so that does take what some would call discipline. But once you get a taste of it, uh, you can only learn through experience. And that really differentiates religious practice where truths are coming you know, th to you by some someone else. And so spiritual evolution is, is really uh, evidential. It's your reality, your experiences that happens to you. And so meditation is the easiest way to, to access spirit in your own hand as you see it. And the most important part is to take away that judgment and that analytical mm. uh, self-editing framework and just to go with what you experience in the raw form and to keep on going deeper within your practice. But eventually, you know, throughout consistent practice, you know, things will begin to crystallize to the surface. But a lot of people expect instantaneous result, and what I would say is through showing up, you know, that's half the ball game meditation. Mm -hmm. So whether that's sitting on, you know, a, a, a chair and closing your eyes or breathing or before bed or doing some of those Reiki self-healing positions as some of the viewers might know, or just simply listening to birds, you know, chirping out there mm -hmm. or the wind blowing, finding some form of expansive connection point that could be a reflective point of your own expansive nature mm -hmm. uh, is, 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 you know, the key to meditation. And, and from my own personal healing experience with you, you uh, capitalized or, or used flower essences. For example, the incense sticks that you used were very particular. <laughs> Thank the, you. Uh, the ambiance that you created, of course, with, 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 the, with the unconditional love, of course. But the music was very particular that was played in the background. It, 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 so we, it seems like we do have music. We have uh, the, the power of senses. I think you had a, a, shark, a chakra charts, chart yeah. in the room drawing attention to these kind of sacred symbols that perhaps people who suffer with concentration, they can focus on these colors. And in many ways, they are raising very gently, perhaps not even knowing it, vibrations. So in, in many ways, they can add to this process in the same way that they remove. Yeah, you know, and why I do that is, you know, the olfactory zones at the nasal cavity is directly related to, to the brain. And so we notice that scent has an associative component with memory, with experiences. If you smell like a good flower, all of a sudden that takes you back to a good experience. And uh, you smell a, a different fragrance, it takes you back. But it's used a lot you know, I, you know, in, in some of the meditation traditions and different spiritual practices as you know, certain scents could, could have a more profound impact in taking you to higher elevated states, most notably frankincense mm. and myrrh, which was handed to Jesus in addition to gold by, I do believe, the three wise men. So it was mm. uh, a commodity product back in the day, and it still is today. Uh, but really, um, spiritual expansion is not ignoring of the five senses. In fact, you're becoming a lot more aware of those senses, mm -hmm. and it expands you. And so I think scent is a, is, is a big one, and sounds are a big one. You know, so really you're becoming a lot more aware of your senses. When we're connecting to thought, we're kind of separated from our spiritual essence. And so scent really allows you to feel, expand mm. more, experience more, become more mindful of the mind-body connection and your capacity to really remove some of the, the thought energy that might block you from flow, mm. as I would call it. Uh, Jake, you have been absolutely generous. Thank you. Uh, with your time here and with the great wisdom that you freely shared, but I, I must I must ask you about your future plans, about the things and talks and, and, and other aspirations moving forward for you. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I have in, a part, in my own apartment a clock that says, now, 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 now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so in a sense, you know, to me there is that, that this moment is, is all there is and ever was. And so you know, when I'm trying to plan my future, I think of what in this moment could I do to act as a building block. Uh, but on a practical basis, you know, for me, in my, my future work is influenced by a drive to really draw out this experience and to really not just discuss what, what happened, but more importantly, what did I learn from it? Because to me, that's the personalization element to it. You know, what happened to me is almost as watching like a good Quentin Tarantino movie, and it was, it was fantastic. And it changed my life and allowed me to 
uh, reconfigure my perceptions on consciousness and on the afterlife. But the bigger, more personal uh, you know, driving point that I have is to make sense of it all, is put some of the pieces of the puzzle together. And so I'm able to do that on a personal level. Uh, it, it enhances my work and what I could provide to the public. And so throughout workshops, you know, my continual outlook towards this experience and its um, implication to my life you know, is changing, as well as the world around us is changing. And so the talk and, and, and discussion and the angles you know, of it are always changing. But to me, it's to really provide some of the big answers to some of those big questions that people have so that bridge between heaven to earth be, could become smaller, that people could re-remember and re-experience who they truly are and to really reframe some of the perceptions and narratives about life after death that we've been inherited and conditioned to. Jacob, thank you ever so much for the time and for the, just allowing us into your world. Uh, it's been a totally immersive experience for me and I'm sure many of our viewers will agree. Thank you again and please do visit us again. Thank you. My pleasure for being on your wonderful program. God bless Thank you. you. Thank you. And friends, that concludes our very first episode of Silent Speaks TV. Tune in again and again, hoping to raise faith and restore faith in God one conversation at a time. Thank you and God bless you.